Hi again, everyone, and welcome to anyone who wasn't at the last session. So um, we've got until one o'clock today, and we're going to have a break at about 11.15. Um, if you need a comfort break uh, during the session, please feel free to, uh, to go and do that. So last time we looked at um, the purpose of a fundraising strategy why it's helpful to have one, where it fits in the context of your organization. We looked at the key elements of what, what you would include in a fundraising strategy. And we started to consider your organization's current position, what's worked well in the past, what hasn't worked well, what kind of skills have you got represented in your team that might inform the kind of fundraising that you might wanna do, and we started to consider the options that we might realistically um, take for our organizations. So today we're gonna cover a review of some of the tasks. So as Kath mentioned, there was a bit of homework, but I completely understand that there may not have been time to, to give that um, any thought between the last session and now. So we'll, we'll spend a bit of time having a look at that in this session this morning. And then we'll actually start to develop the strategy itself and the work plan. And you should all have access to the sort of template documents to use to actually guide this work. So if you haven't had that for any reason, if you pop a message um, in the chat and um, hopefully Kath can direct you to those materials. It, these templates that we've shared with you don't have to be how your fundraising strategy and work plan ends up looking at the end. These are just a, a template that we've seen work well, but if your brain works in a different way and you want to turn it into a spectacular Gantt chart or Excel spreadsheet or anything like that, then that's obviously, that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll start to talk about how to implement the strategy and also how to monitor and review it. And then we'll have a bit of time at the end for, for Q and A's. Um, I, I can see the chat, but um, because I'm sharing my screen, um, it doesn't pop up for me. So if uh, I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on it, but if anybody asks a question, perhaps um, you could just let me know and I will respond. Okay, so um, the questions then that we kind of put to you to consider from last time were these. So, we talked last time about the importance of having some realistic figures in mind and having a budget and how actually it's quite hard to fundraise when your target is kind of open-ended. I think I shared an example last time of one of the first fundraising rules that I had and I asked the trustee board what my target was and then just said raise as much as you can which was pretty terrifying because I didn't know whether that was 20,000 pounds or 2 million pounds. Um, so it's really helpful to try and have an idea of how much your projects are gonna cost, what any of your additional costs, overhead costs are gonna be so that you can have a realistic target. So I'd be interested to hear then, um, perhaps just sharing in the chat, were you all able to have uh, that figure in mind. Maybe you could just pop a, a yes or a no, or um, you know, we don't need to know how much it is, but that will be a really helpful starting point for the rest of this work. Um, if you hadn't had a chance to think about that before now, just take a minute as we're reviewing these questions to try and get a ballpark figure of how much you think it's going to cost to keep your organization going over the next. 12 months. So Vic, we've had one person in the chat has written yes, Carol said yes, and Elizabeth has said no. Okay. So anyone who's said no or not sure, uh, um, if you can, try and sort of do a, a bit of uh, quick arithmetic and, and work out a ballpark figure. Are we talking 50,000 pounds, 150,000 pounds. Maybe just do yourself a quick handwritten list of the different projects that your charity runs, the, the additional costs, the overhead costs that your charity uh, incurs through delivering your programs and see if you can just assign some figures
when you get into budgeting in more detail, it can be a really helpful practice to create a basic budget and a, a stretch budget. So to avoid disappointment, usually I would fundraise, I would base my fundraising targets on the stretch budget. I would know what we had to bring in as a basic level to fulfill our kind of ongoing commitments or you know we know as an absolute minimum that we need to raise x for us to survive this year but we've also got some wish list items we've got some things that we want to do this year and um, if we were allowing ourselves to consider going slightly above and beyond then this is what the budget might look like and I would set my fundraising targets based on that more ambitious one knowing that if we fell short we could still fulfill the basic needs of the charity but that hopefully we will be able to do some of those wish list items and organizational development kind of pieces as well so the second thing that um we'd ask that you have a think about um and i mentioned this last time it's referred to on this slide here as a competitor analysis but let's be more friendly about it and call it a peer analysis so we, we talked about having a little peer analysis, looking at maybe three or four organizations um, that look like you, that are similar to you in terms of the work that they're delivering, that are similar to you in terms of perhaps the location that they're delivering the work in. Um, and we'd ask that you be prepared to feedback in the session on anything that you might have found that was interesting or that there were any trends. Um, you know, I'm not kind of going to start calling on people to uh, 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 share their feedback. Um, but if you did do that and you discovered anything interesting, then pop it in the chat and, and do let us know. It's, it can be really, really useful to carry out a, a peer analysis because you may discover funders that are funder, funding your peers that may be primed to fund you. You may find that there's potential for collaboration with peers. Perhaps you're thinking of embarking on a particular project in a particular region and you find a peer who's already doing that and they're doing it really well and they're experts. So why not collaborate with them? Possibly look at doing joint funding. So then we talked about reviewing your fundraising uh, SWOT analysis. And this is pretty kind of crucial to developing your fundraising plan. Um, it, it will tell you kind of what the elements are that you need to uh, perhaps focus on in terms of building the capacity of your team it will show you where you've got opportunities that you need to perhaps invest whether it's investing with time or money it will show you some threats that you might need to um, have in your peripheral vision um, so a threat for example would be that you were too reliant on trust and foundations you didn't have any individual donors no unrestricted income coming in so if you if you didn't sort of have a time have a have a chance to do this um between the last session and now just do a very quick little swat swot down the side of a piece of paper a couple of strengths what you're really good at a couple of weaknesses what you need to get better at couple of opportunities and a couple of uh, threats because that will inform the work that we're going to do throughout this session. Uh, and then we'd ask you to have a little look at reviewing your options. So um, that meant the, the ways that you're going to fundraise. So bearing all of this in mind, looking at how much you need to raise, looking at your peers, how they raise money successfully, looking at your fundraising SWOT analysis, Bearing all of that in mind, what are the kinds of fundraising that you should try or keep going with? Or what are the ones that you should say, do you know what, we're flogging a dead horse here. Let's just draw a line under this one. We're not going to do that one anymore. So hopefully we are feeling 
uh, that we are ready to start actually developing a bit of a plan. We've got some context. We've had some thinking about some of those sort of building blocks that we need in place to help us to develop our plan. So just a reminder of some of the key terms um, that we're going to be using throughout this uh, session. So the strategy, uh, when we talk about our fundraising strategy, is the approach that we're going to take to achieve our goal. Um, I'm just going to see if I can move you all to the top. Uh, yeah, a fundraising strategy is obviously the approach, the set of approaches that you're going to take to achieve the goals. The objective is the measurable step, the, the kind of action uh, to achieve the strategy and the tactic tactics are the tools that you would use to pursue your objective. Okay. I'm going to just turn my video off because I find it a bit distracting seeing myself. There we go. So um, you should all have your work plan that you can that you can work through here where you can start to write some of these down and, and kind of populate and if, if you haven't just grab a pen and paper and write it down however you want to so we need to start looking at so we've, we've set the scene for our for our fundraising strategy we've thought about the context we've got the SWOT analysis we've come up with a couple of the sort of ways that we think we want to raise money we, we know we might gonna we, we know we might focus on trust and foundations major donors and individuals we need to start coming up with our objectives now and I'm, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with smart objectives um but the the essence of them is that they are realistic that they're they're usually time bound um they're usually measurable i think there's a there's somewhat of a trend at the minute of kind of moving away from smart objectives and coming up with uh, different acronyms. Uh, I've, I've seen a few uh, people talking about how they should be agile and you should be adapting. And so I don't think you need to get too hung up on, you know, hitting every element uh, of, of a smart objective. I do think it's really helpful to be very specific and to be measurable, because if they aren't measurable, you can't tell whether you've been successful or not. And in fundraising in particular, with moving goalposts, it can be very hard for the fundraiser to come up with a realistic plan. So for example, if you set your budget at the start of the year, it might be that you review your budget based on real life events and fundraising progress so far, maybe in the middle of the year, so and, uh, biannually, but moving the goalposts each month uh, is probably not helpful for your, for your fundraising. So I want you all then to think about some real smart targets for your organization. So not hypothetical ones, uh, real ones that would work for, for your organization. So looking at these example, examples, we've got something like, increase individual committed giving committed giving means when you've got someone giving you the same amount each month someone's got a direct debit or a standing order they give you 20 pounds a month it's one of the best ways that a charity can rely on regular steady income coming in month by month it's usually unrestricted it is it is somewhat the gold dust of income uh, in in small charity world so if individual giving, which means fundraising from individuals, from people, from the public, if that was one of your target areas, maybe one of your smart objectives would be to establish or increase your individual committed giving from a certain amount. Let's say you didn't have any people giving to you in that way last year. So this year you want to raise a thousand pounds a year through that. You could look at a financial amount. You could also give yourself a target by saying, okay, we want to acquire 20 new committed givers. At this point, you might not be too bothered about whether they're giving you five pounds or 10 pounds or 50 pounds a month, but you know that you want 20 individuals 
who are going to be giving you money each month. So if it's easier to think about the number of people rather than the, the financial amount, then by all means, start with that. And then you, you know, once you develop your individual kind of regular giving, committed giving stream a bit more, then you'll start to get a sense of how much money comes in through that. The next example here is about trust and foundations income. Now, trust and foundations income is so tricky to predict. As an example, um, my day job, um, I work for a small uh, international development charity. We have a pipeline of possible funders. Um, we apply for 10 times the amount that we need to raise. So we work on a one in 10 success rate. When we set ourselves targets for the year, we do pick a, a financial target, but that is based on the last five years of trusts and foundations kind of data that we have. So we've been investing a lot of time and energy in trusts and foundations income over the last five years. We've got relationships with donors where we know that we are a warm uh, prospect and it's likely that we'll get money from them again so we can kind of predict a little bit more reliably the kind of income that could come through that. If you're just establishing your trusts and foundations income stream and you haven't done anything like this before, it can be really hard to pluck an arbitrary figure out of thin air. So either you could give yourself a financial target, you could say right we want to raise um, £10,000 through trusts and foundations this year, so your target would be 10 times, your, your target number of applications to submit would be, you would need to submit applications to 10 times the value of that 10000 So you would have your target as, we want to raise £10,000, when it comes to actually writing down the tasks linked to that, your tasks would be that you have got to submit applications to the value of. 10 times your, your target. The more that you do your trusts and foundations and any, any kind of fundraising really, the more data you can collect on how things have gone in the previous years, the more accurate your fundraising targets can become. If you're just starting out doing a fundraising strategy, it may feel like you are plucking these figures out of thin air. Um, and I think that's okay to begin with. We, you know, we try to bring in some um, real life information and, and kind of reality into setting ourselves these targets. But the more that you do a fundraising strategy in this way, the more that you'll be able to pick um, realistic targets that are informed by evidence. You can see there's an example um, at the bottom here that doesn't have any figure attached to it. And those kind of targets are also absolutely fine to have in your fundraising strategy. So this target is we want to develop a legacy program. We want to just we want to secure five pledges in 2022. Uh, legacies are really tricky um, in terms of predicting the amount of money that you might raise. You might get a pledge from someone who says, just to let you know, I'm gonna let I'm gonna leave you 500 pounds in my will. This person might be uh, you know decades away from uh, that becoming a reality. So the target is more about the relationship with the individual and the fact that they have told you that they're, that they're pledging rather than trying to factor in actual cash income through that stream. If it would be helpful, perhaps you could put in a couple of um, your SMART objectives into the chat and we could have a look at them as a group. If, you, if you've got one that you're not sure about, if you've, if you've got one that you'd like a bit of feedback on, um, feel free to pop it in the chat and we can, we can have a look. You should probably have, I would say four to six of these that cover the different types of fundraising that you think you're going to be doing at your organization.
I can't see the chat, so just let me know if anything comes up in there that we need to talk about. Uh, nothing so far, no. Okay. Does anyone want a minute to continue thinking on that or are we happy to move on? I don't want, you know, this is an opportunity for you to sort of do your fundraising strategy in real time. So I don't want to rush anyone past. We've got one person who's come. Um, so Carol has written that um, she has a target to write to four businesses who are interested in empowering women and to research Smile Amazon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Sorry. Okay. So if you, if we move on from that now, um, hopefully you've got a couple of um, objectives written down there. It would be helpful for some of them to have figures next to them. So as well as um, targets about exploring uh, new opportunities, if you can start to, through your objectives, break down how you're going to raise the money. So let's say that you looked at your kind of ballpark budget for the year and you know that to keep your organization running for the year, to keep projects going and to fulfill your kind of overhead requirements as well, you need a hundred thousand pounds uh, in the bank, then your objectives should start to give you an indication of where that money's coming from. So if you haven't already, try to give yourself uh, your, your smart targets with, with, a, with a bit of a financial breakdown. So for example, we're gonna bring in 50,000 pounds of that through trusts and foundations. We're gonna bring in 10,000 pounds of that through these new um, business relationships with these uh, businesses who are interested in supporting women, for example. And um, we're gonna to try to establish um, three new relationships with a major donor and they're gonna bring in the rest it's important to start to identify that breakdown to work out where you need to prioritize your, uh, your time and your efforts. So we're gonna start looking at tactics, how we actually do it. So deciding on your tactics, let's take this as an example. So let's say we've said that we, we know that we're bringing in about 50,000 pounds a year through trust and foundations income. Actually, we just wanna maintain that this year. We're not bothered about growing it, but we certainly don't want it to drop below that level. And we just want to maintain it. So your tactics for that objective might be to maintain the relationships with your two current funders who are um, kind of committed to, to giving money to the organization, but you need to steward that relationship you need to ensure that you're reporting back to them you need to make sure that the reporting is really high quality and that it's engaging them and that it's preparing them for future funding requests so let's say that the project that they've funded has actually come to an end but you've got something else in mind that you would like to ask them for when you send them your funding report for your last pot of money you might include a little paragraph at the end of that saying and now we're preparing for our exciting new project X. You don't necessarily ask them for any money in that re uh, funding report, but you plant the seed that there's something else that they might be interested in. One thing that I've kind of learned through doing trusts and foundations um, fundraising and, and reporting is that I have been pleasantly surprised by how many people enjoy just a chat on the phone um, about the project. So sometimes funders very explicitly say, we don't want to hear from you, please don't communicate with us. Um, you know, they don't have a phone number listed on their website um, for that purpose. And they're very clear about the way that they want you to report back. But where it's a perhaps a, a family trust or foundation or whether there's a, uh, where there's a phone number listed, I think it's always worth picking up the phone and, or, or, asking for a time to speak on the phone and just trying to sort of further develop the relationship with your funders 
um, by speaking over the phone because they will have so many projects, so many charities, so many reports to read. And if you can stand out in their minds and try to develop a bit of a, a sort of more deep relationship with them, um, I've found that that is very helpful in sort of securing additional funding and finding out about um, initiatives that they might be running within the trust or the foundation themselves or ideas that they've got that they haven't kind of put out there publicly. So one example is actually before I applied to a particular funder, I asked if I could speak to the grants manager on the phone about the concept because I didn't want to spend six days writing an application if it actually wasn't what they were interested in. So to save myself time, I asked for a chat and we talked through the concept. Um, you know, you're, you're essentially getting a chance to showcase your work and your expertise here. And through doing that, he actually encouraged me to apply to a different kind of pot of funding that wasn't listed anywhere publicly on their website. He said, oh, we've got this thing that we're trying to do at the minute and we're really interested in X, Y and Z and your project sounds like it might fit in with that. Had I not spoken to him on the phone, I would have had no idea that that's something they would have been interested in. And what I ended up applying for was not what I had attend, uh, intended to apply for. Um, and as a result of that initial phone call, we've now got a fantastic relationship with this funder. And actually what they ended up funding was our strategic planning work which is super rare you know i had gone with a project idea i talked about the bigger picture plan for this project and they said we'll give you some money to work that out because we're interested in kind of the long-term plan here so picking up the phone and actually trying to build a relationship with your funder uh, and your funders i think would be a really important tactic and this really applies to sort of any kind of fundraising but i think particularly with trusts and foundations it has you know, a, a relatively short phone call has the potential to uh, unlock something uh, that you that you may not have uh, realized by looking at their sort of standard information on their website. So another tactic that you might uh, adopt is to review the current areas of work and identify that if there are unfunded projects or services or if there are particular elements of your project that you could package up, for example, um, uh, a real life example of this is that uh, we have a vocational training center. We provide free vocational training and well-being support to young people. Within that, we have kind of a sub project of focusing on the girls and women in particular, providing them with menstrual health hygiene packs, um, providing them with childcare vouchers to be able to come to training when their children need childcare we package that up as a distinct project and apply specifically to funders who express interest in funding girls and women's projects. There is another element within our program where we have um, our students um, growing crops on the center sites to uh, grow, to eat on for the feeding program, but also to generate a little bit of extra money for the uh, centres themselves. So we package that up and we approach funders who are interested in agribusiness and agriculture and permaculture. So a lot of fundraising, in particular with trusts and foundations fundraising, is about how you can parcel up different elements of your programme and activities to fit the needs of the funder. You might not consider yourselves a girls and women's charity, you might not consider yourselves an environmental or agricultural charity, but are there elements of your work that could be presented in that way to a funder who's particularly interested in that? And in the same way that you would nuance your CV every time you applied for a job, you nuance your the way that you present your funding applications every time you apply to a new funder. So, you, so one of your tactics, if you're looking at trusts and foundations, might be that you would look at all of your program areas and you would package them up into different categories ready to be presented to funders in those ways. Another one of your tactics might be that you would develop a database of potential funders and you might target four applications a month um, from a particular quarter. So hopefully you can see the difference here between the way that we talk about the tactics as in the how and then the objective. So um, 
your kind of, uh, was it, I think Carol's saying about um, writing to the four businesses or researching Amazon Smile, those might be your tactics and your objective might be something like um, to raise £5,000 through corporate partnerships. One of your tactics is to write to four businesses who are interested in empowering women. One of your um, targets might be to raise £5,000 of unrestricted income, income that comes in through a variety of different uh, ways, but it's unrestricted, as in you can spend it on whatever you want. And so one of your tactics might be to research Amazon Smile and sign up to an account, because that's a way that you're going to bring in a little trickle of unrestricted income. So if we take a minute just to write down some tactics for each of your objectives, and if anyone's feeling uh, sort of lost on the differences here or wants to ask any questions, please do feel free to contribute, uh, ask a question uh, yourself or pop it in the chat. Here are some tips on identifying tactics. So we obviously want tactics that are realistic for us to um, fulfill. So we all know how much time we have to spend on this. Some of you might be doing this full time. Some of you might be doing it part time. Some of you might be doing it in the evenings and weekends on top of a, a different day job. So we have to identify tactics that are appropriate uh, and realistic. So start by thinking about who you've got. Stewarding your existing supporters. You know, it's going to be much it's, it's going to be much easier. It's probably going to be a better use of your time to really look after the people who are already interested in giving to you. They've already shown you that they're interested uh, in supporting your Christmas campaign or that they, they give you five pounds a month. And perhaps if you stewarded them really well, they would give you 10 pounds a month. So if you're limited on your time, then focusing on who you've already got and increasing what they're giving is likely um, going to be a better return on your time than trying to, to go out and find new people. It might be that when time allows, you go out and you decide you want to add new people, but we need to bear in mind your kind of your capacity on this. Oops, let's get back. Yeah, so Carol's added in the chat here that the partner in, partner in Uganda needs to scope projects and sends the concept and budgets uh, ready for us to seek funders. Absolutely. Um, you know, if your partner is uh, has the capacity to be doing that, to be scoping out the projects that they want to um, that they want to implement, if they need to be able to tell you how much is involved in that, you then need to consider whether any of your time has a cost implication. So let's say that your partner sends you um, a proposal. They say, here are the three projects we want to implement. We estimate that our budget for these projects is as, as so. You then might need to add in any of your UK costs. And we try to recover all of the costs of our projects when we're doing any kind of fundraising. So if your project costs £5,000 to deliver, but it takes you 20 hours a week of your time and you would like to start recovering some costs for your time if you're currently volunteering, add that into your funding applications as well. So some other tactics, um, some other tips for your tactics. So map your networks. We're going to come on to this later in the session, but I think it's really valuable to look at who you've got involved in your organization and to map out who you know that could help you. Um, do you know someone who runs a business? Do you know someone who knows someone who runs a business? Do you know someone who's really excellent at researching? Do you know someone who's an excellent creative writer and could do some fundraising for you? Um, do you know someone who is an ex-teacher um, and has uh, kind of lots of um, great experience in terms of uh, project design or, or writing or planning and they've recently retired and they want to sort of do something rewarding and fulfilling and could you provide them with that opportunity? We'll, we'll come on to uh, how to do some network mapping um, later. So think about the different stages in 
the uh, relationship with your funders or with your individual people who are supporting you? What will you need to do to identify perhaps who your existing uh, supporters are? What will you need to do to engage them? Um, and how will you sort of successfully present your case to them? So the approach that you take with a corporate may be very different to the approach that you take with an individual or a trust or foundation. Have you got different people within your organization who would be better suited for those different approaches? So for example, some people like to talk in a more kind of um, evidence-based academic type of way. Some people prefer the relationship building element where they get to know the people, uh, the donors and the where they get to you know, talk about personal stories and, and they're quite comfortable meeting someone for coffee chatting to them and then asking them for some money. Some people would be horrified by doing that and therefore they may be better placed sitting behind the computer writing applications. So work with kind of what you've got in your organization. And uh, if a particular type of fundraising feels really out of the comfort zone, um, then don't force yourself to, to do it. So what groundwork do you think uh, you'll need to do to be ready for the particular types of fundraising? So let's say that you've set one of your objectives as you'd like to develop relationships with some companies and get some money from them. Do you need to go on some training about corporate fundraising? Do you need to do some reading up about the best ways to approach those uh, types of partnerships? Because it's a whole discipline in itself, corporate fundraising. Um, there are people who are experts at this. Um, I have, I've recently been working with uh, our chair of trustees who works in that field, and he has really opened my eyes to the kind of science behind developing those kinds of relationships. And so I've learned a lot in, in this last year um, about, about how to do that, and it has really uh, changed the way that I approach that. So if you're trying to identify some perhaps uh, some corporate partners, then maybe one of the tactics is before you do that, that you need to upskill yourself a bit, you need to attend some training or do a bit of reading on the best ways uh, of approaching that to maximise your chances of success. So it's time for a little breakout. Um, Kath, I think I saw a message from you about suggesting that we maybe break into um, halves. Yep, I can do yeah. that for you now. So before we break out into the uh, rooms, what we're going to do is just have 10 minutes just reflecting on those objectives and targets and sharing them with each other and just getting a bit of um, feedback and, and thoughts from, from our peers. So if we split into two groups and we have 10 minutes, just take the opportunity to feed back to the, the rest of the people in your group what you've identified as your objectives and perhaps some of your tactics. Um, given that we've only got 10 minutes and there'll be three or four people in each group, if we start with objectives and then if time allows, we'll, we'll look at uh, tactics as well. So we'll start to look now at how you might actually lay your plan out. So... You can really do this in any way that works well for you. Um, I like to do my plans either using a Gantt chart style in um, a spreadsheet, which allows you to sort of almost have it in calendar mode. So you can see throughout the year when your busy periods are, whether you've got four or five different objectives coming up to achieve within the same quarter, in which case you need to spread them throughout the, the year. Um, I also use tools like Asana and Trello, which are online free. Um, there are paid versions, but you can have a free version as well. And it's, it's basically um, like project management, but you can give yourselves, um, you, you can set it up so that you've got your objectives, you've got your activities that relate to that objective. You can set them, uh, you can assign them to a particular person, you can assign a date, it will send you reminders of what's upcoming. Um, Asana, if you tick off a number of uh, objectives that you've achieved, then a little unicorn flies across the screen to reward you. So if you feel like you need to be motivated by a unicorn flying across your screen, then Asana is the one to go for. But this is one way that you might plan out your work. So you might have your 
planned income along the uh, in the first column there, that, that would be what your target is. So let's say you were going to have uh, a target of raising uh, £50,000 through Trust and Foundations fundraising. You could include there in the next column what you'd secured so far. So let's say you've got a relationship with a funder and they agree to give you £15,000 a year for the next three years. So you know you've already got £15,000 secured. Then you've got what's left over. In the next column, you've got KPI, so key performance indicators. What kind of tasks are you going to um, set yourself? What kind of um, targets, if you like, are you going to set yourself that you're actually going to test yourself on or check yourself on um, at key points throughout the year? It is helpful to have some of these because I think it helps to focus your mind um, a bit in kind of having something to aim for it can it can feel quite aimless all of this and so it's nice to have something where you have got some uh, you've got an actual target that at the end of the year or halfway through the year you can say to yourself yes i managed that or no i didn't manage that and let's think about why so some of your key performance indicators for this type of uh, objective of raising 50,000 through trusts and foundations might be that you're going to do you're going to submit four applications a month from quarter two. You might then say that your other performance indicator is that you want to achieve a one in eight success rate on those applications. The sector average used to be one in seven. As I mentioned earlier, I'm now working on a one in 10 to avoid disappointment, which doesn't always work, but <laughs> that's my oh. self-preservation tactic there to, um, to, to, to hope to be kind of pleasantly surprised rather than frequently disappointed, which is uh, more, more what happens. So then the next column is where you're going to have most of your uh, sort of fleshing out. You're going to write in here your key tasks. So you can see the examples here. You might have that you're going to maintain your two current funders through effective stewardship. And so how you're going to do that is you're going to submit your project reports on time. You're going to share an impact video and an, maybe an additional report that perhaps they hadn't asked for, but you think they would really like to see. Maybe you know that one of the trustees on the board of the funder, uh, of the funder um, is, you know, loves to chat and will just chat your ear off if they have the opportunity. And so you know that you're going to make a special effort to ring that person um, and just really try and foster that relationship with them. One of your tasks might be that you need to prepare uh, case expressions or a case for support for all of your unfunded areas of work. So we talked earlier about how you might want to package up your programs into uh, sort of neat little bundles that you can then put out to funders. You'll need to actually work on, on that packaging process. So you'll need to have for each of those a, a case for support, uh, a standard application that would include the need for your project, um, what your project does to respond to that particular area, whether it's girls and women or agriculture, environment, um, maybe a sub budget of the of the program that relates to that element of the work specifically. Uh, and then kind of what you're going to ask as a, as a typical donation, you know, have you got some key elements of the program that need to be funded that you could tell people, you know, £1,000 will achieve X. £5,000 will achieve this. So the, the, the tasks, it's really helpful to have these kind of grouped by the, the tactics that we talked about earlier. So you'll see that um, they are they kind of have a main heading and then the, the, the tasks sort of um, as subheadings underneath. So grouping these together by those tactics uh, that you'd identified is a good way to, um, to organise this. Then we've got a column for dates. So again, a practical sort of thing on this is I always overestimate how long things are going to take. Um, and I usually do the assigning dates exercise twice. I go through and I assign what I think might be realistic. I plot it in a, in a Gantt chart or a calendar, or I have a quick scan and say, oh dear, I seem to have given myself a target of May for all of these. And actually that's uh, you know, the school holidays or whatever it might be. 
you might know that you've got, you know, the group, the group of people that are working on this, you might know that all of these people are parents. And so they will be doing nothing over the six weeks holidays because they will have children to look after. Or I know that I'm going away for a Christmas holiday. So it will be really silly of me to organize a Christmas campaign. So, you know, factor in the human element to this and, and consider what is practically possible with the team that you've got. Then we might want to think about the resources required. So the human resource, how long do you think it's going to take of a person's time? How many people need to be working on this? Is it going to require any financial resource? If you really want to do trust and foundations fundraising and you're confident that that's one of the best ways that you can bring in money, but you don't have anyone in your team who can currently deliver that, then are you going to need to assign some budget to perhaps bring a consultant in to help you develop your case for support and train you up a bit on how to uh, submit a great application? Are you at the point where that is something that you want to consider? Um, do you want to upskill yourself to be able to do that? In which case you might need to attend more training. So how many days are you going to allow yourself to bring yourself up to speed on your skills before um, actually starting to do the work and it's tempting just to dive straight in I think with these things but spending a month and perhaps a little bit of money on getting a really amazing case for support and really kind of bringing yourself up to speed with how to submit an excellent funding application is time and money well spent when it comes to then the, the sort of return on investment or the, the potential for success with your applications um, I've, I've been in the place myself and I've spoken to lots of other people who say, I just keep submitting funding applications. I never get any success. It's always a rejection. And it turns out that they're sending the same standard to pager to every funder. It's not being nuanced for each funder's requirements. Um, perhaps they are someone who is really highly skilled in the program work, but not a professional fundraiser. And the way that it's written isn't what a funder would expect to see. So that person could have spent countless hours in the year submitting those applications, but the outcome remains the same because actually they need to do a bit of work on the, the process that they're following for submitting those applications and spending a little bit of time or a little bit of money improving the prospects uh, would be kind of be beneficial in the, in the long term. And the final thing that's really helpful to, to do um, is something called a RASCI. So identifying kind of who is, who are the key players in the organization who are gonna be helping to meet this objective and what are they each gonna be responsible for? So who's gonna be ultimately responsible? It could be our FR, the fundraiser. Who's gonna be accountable? So that might be the trustees. The, the trustees are gonna make sure that they're keeping in touch with the um, fundraiser and that the fundraiser is on track. I appreciate that in a small charity context, sometimes this is all the same person. So <laughs> I've attended plenty training in my time where I've been thinking, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's also me. That's also me. Okay, great. So I'm on my own. Um, but if you, do people, <laughs> if you do have any people that you can bring in on this, then, uh, you know, it, it is absolutely um, better to, to do this in, in collaboration with someone than to go it alone. It can be quite lonely fundraising. Um, who's going to be your S, your support? Have you got any volunteers who could support you with some researching, for example, a bit of administrative report? Um, who's going to uh, collaborate? Are you going to have program staff in, involved? Um, and who is going to be informed? Um, sorry, consult is C, so collaborate and consult. Who's going to be um, collaborating and consulting on this? Are you going to have your program staff, um, as Carol mentioned earlier? Um, kind of getting you information from the field. Are they going to need to contribute to this? Are they going to be consulted? You know, I found this great funder. I, I think I'm going to approach them for this project. Are you, are you happy with that? Um, and then who's going to be informed? So again, your trustees might be responsible, but they might need to be informed as well. So as I said, it's important to consider whether something like this would actually work for, work for you and your organization. And if you don't think it would work for you and your organization, maybe just take a moment now to think about 
who is going to be using this kind of plan? Is it you? Is it other people within your organization? And therefore, what would be the best tool to use? Are you spreadsheet people? Are you pen and paper people? Are you fancy flying across the screen unicorns people? Um, however you want to do it, having it written down is really important and having it written down in a way where you're using it week in, week out um, and, and making sure that it works for you in that way is really, really important. So we're going to move on to um, implementing and reviewing the plan. So hopefully we've all got a bit of an idea now of what the plan might look like. We might have some objectives. We might have a couple of um, kind of tasks associated with that. I'm going to look at some practicalities now. So we're going to, in a minute, we're going to do a network mapping exercise. And I just want to give an example of this, a case study from a real small international development charity called HIPS. Um, so this is a case study from Jess. She's their um, sort of operations and development director. So she is a paid member of staff. Um, so she, you know, she has more time on this uh, than uh, those of us who are doing this voluntarily. So she decided that she wanted to focus her, um, one of her objectives uh, for her fundraising strategy was going to be to focus on corporate and statutory funding. And they wanted to uh, open out their connections. They wanted to expand their connections through their board of trustees. And they were very intentionally planning to use their trustees to um, mine them for their connections, essentially. So she saw her role, Jess, as making the board interested enough to actually do this and kind of impressing on them the importance of them doing this to support the charity and then facilitating the work itself to help them open up their contacts. So she spent time getting to know the board as individuals. So she had, you know, phone calls, meetups with each individual trustee, not doing it in a group setting where she found originally trying to do it in that way. People didn't really engage with it. They were sort of hiding behind the other members of the board and hoping that they would do it instead. And so going to the board members one by one, she found really worked well. And um, so she asked them to start bringing their contacts uh, to, to her. So she would uh, sit down with them, she would get to know them, she would get to know about them personally, and then she would start to have the conversation with them about, you know, I think we would be really well matched with X, uh, X company. Didn't you say you had someone that you knew there or you used to work there or you have a colleague who could possibly? And she started to map out the potential contacts uh, that her trustees had that could be useful. She does acknowledge in this case study that she was really lucky to have trustees that were open to learning and open to opening their networks. And I think that is kind of a big part of the challenge um, with this sort of thing is that you may have people on your board who are who feel quite private about their work with the charity. They, they feel really uncomfortable about asking people for money. Um, and I would say obviously never force someone to do something that they don't wanna do, but that I think we do have a role in working in fundraising to help our trustees to understand that fundraising is not a dirty word and that we're a charity and we need money. And that's how we do it. And it doesn't have to make people uncomfortable. We can do it in a way that feels comfortable. And, um, you know, if you're really needing to convince your trustees, actually, if there's a lot of research that suggests that people enjoy being asked to support charities, as long as they don't feel cornered on it. Um, there was some sort of trends in fundraising um, research done. And it was really reassuring to me because the majority of people said, I don't mind being asked to give money to charity. I don't mind being asked to help an organization, especially if it's one that I know, unless I feel like the ask is unreasonable. And unless I feel like I'm being given no option to say no. So if you're asking 
people or your trustees are asking people and one you're not totally catching them off guard like you say you're going to go for a coffee and then you ask them for 10 grand oh that's a bit of a surprise um or you sort of guilt them into you know giving giving you money you know those tactics are likely to upset people but if you if you give people an exciting opportunity to support your fantastic charity and of course it's fine if they're not in the position to be able to do that at the minute but we think you'll be really interested in this project and it's really fascinating and we would love for you to be one of the first people to help us get it off the ground you know how you present it to people matters and how you present it to your board of trustees matters too because you want them to feel comfortable in opening up their contacts to you so jess made it really explicit when recruiting trustees that there would be an expectation for them to open up their contact books so that had helped kind of set the scene so they went through a process of recruiting new trustees when they did that they made it very clear in the in the sort of application process that when you're a trustee of this charity you help with fundraising um, if you're a fundraiser yourself either you do the fundraising or you perhaps donate yourself to the organization or you help us to get to people who can give us money um, this is a little bit of a harsh little phrase but i have heard the phrase you either give you get or you get off the board so you either give money you help us to get money or you make way for someone who's happy to support with fundraising and i think that's particularly kind of important with small charities you know in any organization within fundraising we hear the phrase everyone's a fundraiser you know if your if your ceo meets somebody and it's somebody who could be beneficial to the charity that person needs to become a fundraiser in that moment and start explaining to that person about this fantastic work if one of your trustees is at a business meeting and there's an opportunity for a charity of the year if they are not your advocate in that moment then there's a problem um, if you've got volunteers, if you, you know, anyone who's involved needs to somehow contribute to helping the organization stay afloat financially. And there's lots of different ways in which people can do that. And so if you have someone who's nervous about making the ask, they don't have to do that, but they might have to um, help you do a bit of research or open up their contact book to someone who could do that. Um, it's obviously easier to do that when you're recruiting newer trustees because you can be explicit about that expectation up front. When you've got trustees who've been on the board for a, a period of time already and that wasn't the expectation when they started, it can take a bit of work in kind of helping to turn the ship on that one um, and starting to sort of impress upon everybody the importance of helping with income generation. Here's what Jess said. It's really important to make sure you know what all the links are with the board so work it through one by one you might not be able to manage 20 new contacts and nurture and steward those relationships but a smaller number is achievable we're going to have a go at doing this now so you should i think have a worksheet on this Do you? <laughs> Maybe someone could. Uh... I sent it out in an email uh, this morning and earlier in the week. Okay. Can somebody let me know if they don't have it and I'll resend it to you? Just so we can deal with the heavy silence. If anybody uh, <laughs> has got it, can you just let us know? <laughs> Kath, would you mind emailing that to me, actually? Just so yeah, can, sure, no worries, Vic. Uh, remind myself what it looks like. I've just seen your message as well about uh, full cost recovery. So I'm just gonna make a note of that somewhere at the end so that I don't forget to mention that. Yeah. 
Um, well, we're on the topic of um, trustees. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I'm totally of the opinion that getting the right trustee board can be completely transformational for a small charity. Um, when I joined my day job uh, where I'm working now, um, the organisation was about 17 years old and the majority of the board members had been around since day dot. And they were all, um, sorry, the yeah, majority of the uh, board members, they'd been around for a really long time. Um, they were all absolutely lovely, well-meaning people. Um, none of them came from a charity background. Their only exposure to charity world was within that charity. And they had been through the mill with many challenges over the last decade or so, and they were kind of ready to hand over the reins. Um, and so all but one left and we recruited a whole new board with a diverse kind of range of uh, charity sector experience, focusing on fundraising, because that was our urgent need at that time we needed, I needed help from expert fundraisers. Um, and we made the we made it clear that the expectation was that they would support with a bit of operational volunteering as well as just giving their advice and guidance and attending quarterly meetings. Um, and it completely transformed my experience as the director of the charity, having those people around me, and it completely transformed the entire organization. So I almost think that that is the most valuable thing that you could spend time on doing as a small charity if you feel that you don't have the capacity to do fundraising or strategy work or anything else that you might need to do getting the right people on your board of trustees can be absolutely critical to success okay so let me just stop sharing for a moment and get my emails open. So did we get, com did, did people have this? <laughs> did we, did anyone say? Sorry, I've had some things in the chat. Carol, okay. can I just check? I have sent it to you twice, Carol. Can I just check your email address is the GBV email address? Yeah, it, it is, Kath. It's just, I haven't opened my mail at all. Um, just recently, I, I've got a backlog of mail you know to open so i just wondered if you could just send it to me again because it's, so it's an excellent tool no worries just to make sure that i do have it thank you fab thanks all right fab thank you okay i've got that now as well thank you so network mapping um basically what we want to do here is work out who we know through who we know, sort of seven degrees of separation. So um, we want to understand who we might involve in a network mapping um, exercise. So hopefully it would be our board of trustees. Are there any other people that you would involve? Have you got any key volunteers? Have you got any supporters? You know, a really loyal supporter can be an amazing advocate. They don't have to be just your board. You might have someone who's supported you for years and they think you're the best thing since sliced bread and they would love nothing more than to tell all their friends and colleagues about your work. You know, do you know them well enough to bring them in on this? And actually bringing in some of your key supporters into sort of internal matters like this can feel so lovely for that supporter. You know, you value them so much that you've brought them in to the inner circle and you're asking them for help. Um, and I've seen that work really well for supporters in terms of uh, an actual kind of relationship building tool. So maybe you start to write down a list of who you might involve in your network mapping exercise. So your trustees, any names of key supporters that you might want to involve, um, any of your friends or colleagues that you think would be willing to kind of open up their networks to you for the charity. And then we want to sort of consider for each of those people or for that group, what the motivations might be for them. So 
is the motivation for them that you've told them that they need to do this and uh, you know they're happy to oblige or do they really want to be a part of the fundraising do they want to do the asking and so just getting a sense of uh, what people's motivations are for participating in this can help to give you a sense of um, you know what the outcome or what the action might be for that person. You can think about whether you want to focus on a particular form of fundraising. It can be easier to help maybe focus people's minds um, to do that. So let's say that you did really want to look into corporates and you felt like your program, your organization was really well aligned with uh, having a corporate partnership. You might want to do this exercise with that in mind. So you would speak to your trustees and say, OK, does anybody have a contact at um, you know any companies that might uh, sit well with us in terms of our values and our type of work. If you decided that one of your objectives was going to be to increase the number of people who give each month, then you might want to have this exercise, you might want to do this exercise with that in mind. You might be able to sit down and go through your trustees and say, okay, um, do any of your friends ever seem particularly interested in this? Do you talk to your friends about your involvement with our charity? You know, could each trustee be responsible for bringing in five new people? And you would work out a plan with each trustee on how they would do that. You know, next time you're at one of your, um, you know, exercise netball classes, for example, you know, get chatting to people. Does anyone seem like they're interested? Um, if, if people feel comfortable in doing that, if they're armed with the skills to be able to talk about it and they're kind of genuinely enthusiastic about the work of the charity and um, if they feel comfortable in actually asking people like that then that can be a really good way of just expanding the network for something like individual giving so what might help the participants in your network mapping to give their contacts over what might help them to feel comfortable well you might want to tell them exactly what you're going to do with them so, you know, if I give you this person's contact, if I make an introduction to this person, what are you actually going to ask them? So you might almost need to um, sort of pre-pitch whatever it is that you're going to do with this contact to the, the person who the contact belongs to. So if it was a company, for example, someone might not feel comfortable opening up that contact if you were going to go in and ask them for something that was really extreme or didn't seem like it actually did fit with them. But if you worked with the trustee or the person whose contact it was to do research on the company, to research the individual that you were going to approach and together to come up with the, the approach that you were going to make, then it would enable the person to feel a bit more comfortable. And you would work with them to say, OK, do you want to just write an email that says, I'm a trustee for this fantastic charity. I think their work aligns really well with what your company does. And I wanted to make an introduction to see whether there's any potential for you to work together and just leave it over to you. Or do they want to actually be involved in the whole process of building that relationship? So fundraising is generally all about relationships. Um, and so connecting with people, developing a relationship, both with your trustees and your supporters and your volunteers and the people they introduce you to is really crucial. So you might have um, done your network mapping exercise. So you know it can look however you want it to look. It can, it can be a spider diagram kind of thing. It could be your person's name, whether it's your trustee or supporter or, you know, or volunteer, and then just a long list of the people that they're willing to introduce you to. Um, you, you, can, you can kind of write it down however you want to. Um, you can get network mapping prompts online. <laughs> it's literally just a, a huge long list of like dentist, teacher, optometrist, and it just kind of, <laughs> helps you to think oh actually yeah I do my dentist did, did say one time that their like daughter was interested in volunteering but so you you know you can get these prompts that are helpful because quite often what happens is you sit down to do these network mapping exercises and people go 
I really don't know anyone, you know, I'm, I don't know anyone. And, and then you actually start getting into it and they're like, ah, oh, actually there is this person on the school run who once mentioned that they did. And once the brain starts to get going, you realize that you actually do know a lot of people, um, but, but they need that prompt often. Uh, and once you've got your list, uh, as Jess's um, sort of quote said, yeah, 20 new people might be totally unrealistic, but work with your trustee or your person to identify, okay, of these 20 new contacts, realistically, who do you think is going to be, who's going to sort of bear the most fruit? Who's going to be the most realistic here? And let's come up with a plan for those five. Okay. I'm going to just share my screen again. And so here is step by step how we would do a network mapping exercise. So we bring the team together, whether that is, you know, doing it as an entire group or whether you want to split off and do it with the individuals. You would try and just add as many names as you can under each category. So you could use the categories that were, hang on, let me just show you. You could use these categories. Or you could use one of those network mapping tools uh, to kind of give you some prompts for categories. And the categories are really just to help guide the thinking on uh, who are all the potential people that I might know. So you would add names under each of the categories. You could use different colored pens, post-it notes. And if you're doing this in a, in a room together, uh, you know, you could have it on the wall behind you. Um, a good tool to use if you're doing it online, but together is a Google Jamboard. You can all populate little sticky notes. It's like having a virtual wall with post-it notes. So we could then add in our wish list contacts under each category. Um, so who do we know that we want to connect with? And can we find some sort of seven degrees of connection to that person or that company through the people in the room here? So you might write down just the people that your contacts know, but your wish list people or organizations or companies might be one who seemingly you don't have any current connections with but let's actually see whether somehow we do have a way in to those people or places. Step four, so what can the contact offer? Because it's not always gonna be money. And when we're thinking about fundraising, sometimes it isn't money. Sometimes it's actually a further contact. So could it be influence? Let's say, actually, I think I know someone who's an MP, who's a celebrity, they might not give us money themselves, but, the, but could they kind of introduce us to or influence other people to take action or give money? Have they got time? Someone might say, uh, I'm friends with someone who's a management consultant and she does a business strategy. They might be able to help us with our strategic plan. Um, is it passion? You know, have you got someone, as I said, like one of your amazing supporters who is just so passionate about your work and could think of nothing better than to sing from the rooftops to all their friends and family? And, uh, you know, uh, amazingly, there are sort of people who just seem to love doing that. And I have had, I've had one person in my lifetime uh, working in uh, the sector who would just love us to ask her, um, this church group have asked us to go and do a presentation about the charity. Would you mind going? And she would love doing it. She loved meeting people. She loved talking uh, and she loved the charity. And so she became our amazing advocate. Can they bring contacts? So maybe it's not the person themselves that is the contact. Maybe they can open their networks up to further contacts. Would it be a financial contribution, which would be great, but it's certainly not the be all and end all when it comes to this process. Um, and can they bring expertise? So all of these things are valuable to our organization. When we do network mapping, it's not just about, do I know any rich people? Because the, the answer is in many cases, no. Um, and it's not, do I know people who own their own businesses? Because again, the answer is often, no, I don't actually, you know, that's not the kind of circle that I 
operate in at all. But you might find that through this exercise, you find that you're connected to quite a lot of people who are recently retired, would love to be sort of um, intellectually stimulated by something and have time. And so, you know, you get four or five of those people, they might be interested in attending training on fundraising and helping you to write funding proposals or doing research. You might be connected to people who might have influence over others. And so thinking beyond just, do I know people with money uh, is really important in this exercise. So the fifth step would be that we would identify motivations. So do they want to be sort of philanthropic? You know, are they, are they genuinely motivated by being philanthropic? Are they motivated because they would love for everyone to know that they were doing this? And which is fine, that is what motivates some people. Do they want the social recognition? Do they want to have, you know, a, a school block named after them at one of your projects? You know, we can appease these whims for ten thousand pounds. <laughs> um, you know, but that is a genuine motivation for some people. They do want the, the social recognition. Um, is there motivation that they have an affinity to the cause? So, do they have personal lived experience of your cause, and now they genuinely really want to help? Do they feel particular affinity to the work that you're doing for some reason, and that is their motivating thing? Uh, and is there a mutual benefit? So, for example, somebody is uh, in an influential position at a company. That company doesn't currently have a corporate social responsibility um, kind of package. So it's becoming more and more expected now of businesses that they are contributing socially, whether that's to things like environmental causes or they're having, you know, they're having some sort of, uh, they're making some sort of contribution to the sustainable development goals. It's probably the kind of thing that a lot of companies think, oh, we really ought to think that CSR policy, like, you know, so-and-so can, can deal with that, but it's not, not high on our priorities. Could it be mutually beneficial for you and for a company if you went to them to say, we think your work is really closely aligned with what we're doing and our values. Um, it looks like you don't currently have any charity partners or any CSR policy. We'll help you make one and we'll be your sort of vehicle to achieve your CSR goal. So that's great. Someone's just come in and ticked something off their list for them. It's come to them, but packaging it up and making sure that you kind of present it to them as a benefit to them um, and you know this is the sort of thing that I've learned on from doing these uh, trainings myself uh, specifically on corporate fundraising um, and that can be another possible way in. Um, there could also be a mutual benefit with someone for example with expertise and time let's say that you've got a younger person who's um, at the peak of their career in the charity sector they've or they've been working in UK causes for 10 years, um, but they really want to move into the international development sector. Um, could you approach them for some pro bono skills volunteering in return for you being able to facilitate the experience that they need to be able to say, I've done this project at this international development charity? And so thinking about the, the possible mutual benefits um, when you're doing this exercise uh, can, can really help as well. Okay, so we're gonna have another breakout. Um, if we have it for, I think 10 minutes, we'll be fine for this one. Um, and just have a bit of a think in your group about who you're gonna involve. Are you gonna do it sort of specific to a type of fundraising or you're just gonna keep it general? And maybe some ideas to share with each other on what you think might people might help people participate because um some of you here might be trustees of your organization you might know your trustees really well and think they're going to hate this they're not going to be open to this at all so perhaps let's start to share some ideas with each other about what you think might help people participate and imagine if you were being asked to do something like this what would make you feel comfortable in participating so we're going to move on now to just having a little think about tactics and whether uh, our tactics are ethical and legal. So let's hope they are. I can't imagine anybody will be doing anything uh, 
unethical or illegal intentionally, but it is important just to make sure that we're up to speed with um, kind of fundraising uh, laws and fundraising kind of best practice. So if you're not already, you might want to consider joining um, or re registering with the fundraising regulator. Um, a lot of sort of individuals or funders might expect to see that logo on your website somewhere. Um, let me just, there we go. Sorry, I was just checking which order my slides were in. So um, there are some policies that you might wanna have in place uh, within your organization before you kind of really get going with fundraising, just to have your belt and braces on. Um, so you'll need a data protection policy because if you're starting to process people's personal information legally, you need to tell them what you're gonna do with that, where it's being stored. If you're further down the line in your organization's life cycle, it might be that you have a customer relationship management tool, what they call a CRM tool. And it's like an, you know, an online database where you capture people's personal information. Um, that usually comes with its own data protection kind of package. If you're not at that stage yet, you might just have people's personal details in a spreadsheet somewhere or on a piece of paper in your house or in your emails. And so you might need to consider where you're going to store that and what would be the sort of best practice to ensure that that data is safe. If you work on a personal computer and you work in a cafe, you leave your desk, you leave your uh, computer on the table while you go to the toilet and you've got a spreadsheet up with people's email addresses and phone numbers and bank details for their direct debit that's a, a risk. And so you might want to have something in your data protection policy that explains that we use our personal computers, but it has a password on it that when you open it, you have to put a password in, or we have a um, password protected spreadsheet where people's personal data is held. And these are the different ways that we will and won't use your personal data. Um, and there are some um, good examples of of most policies on places like the NCVO website. Um, data protection and privacy policies, I think might be the one exception that aren't on the NCVO website because they sort of say that they need to be specific to each organization, but they um, there are some examples of this in the um, shared Google Drive in the Small International Development Charities Facebook group. Um, I can put the link into that um, in a sec when we are doing an activity or something. I'll just make a note of that. That folder has tons of free examples of policies and procedures if ever anyone's ever looking for that sort of thing. Um, so you'll need a safeguarding policy that thinks about fundraising. So typically your safeguarding policy you might consider would be for your beneficiaries. It might be sort of child protection and safeguarding focused in that respect but you'll also need to think about how you safeguard your donors. So do you have any donors who could be vulnerable, vulnerable to um, fundraising requests? Have you got anyone on your mailing list who, um, yeah, may need to have kind of special measures in place or are there kind of considerations with safeguarding when it comes to um, the way that you fundraise? People often now have a distinct ethical fundraising policy. I think that's something worthwhile having. And again, there's an example of one of these um, in that shared Google Drive and probably also on uh, NCVO's website. But it'll often include things like, you know, as an organization, we have all agreed that we're not gonna accept donations from tobacco companies, for example, or oil companies. You know, if you're Greenpeace, you're unlikely to receive, you know, to accept a donation from. Uh, an oil company or Shell or whoever it might be. And so it's worthwhile sitting down with your um, trustees, your staff members, maybe some of the people who access your programs to say, you know, is there anywhere, any kind of organization that we would not feel comfortable accepting money? Do we want to take it on a case by case basis? And if Shell did turn up on the doorstep and say, we'll give you uh, £500,000 towards X project, it would be sorely tempting. Would we would we reconsider our ethical standpoint on that? Because the possible impact would be so great on the communities that we serve. Um, you know, it's a it's a really tricky one, but it's definitely important to sort of have some uh, discussions on on that with your team. 
you might find that you need to have a set of brand guidelines, which would include not only how the charity is kind of visually represented, but also how the charity is talked about. So let's say you do expand your network and other people who aren't directly involved in the charity's work start to talk about the charity's work. You would need to give them copies of the policies that you wanted them to adhere to. And you would need to give them something that was a bit of a crib sheet for, okay, here's how we talk about the charity's work. We don't use this kind of language. We do use this kind of language. We don't use these kind of photographs. So for example, in our brand guidelines where I work, we talk about how we use po uh, positive imagery. We don't use any degrading imagery. We don't use any imagery or language that presents our young people as um, in a, some sort of desperate state or, um, you know, we're, we're trying obviously very hard to move away from that sort of poverty porn approach to fundraising. And we stipulate this in our brand guidelines. And so anyone who comes to us, whether it's a volunteer who wants to run a marathon, wants to fundraise for us, or whether it's a volunteer who wants to come and do um, trust and foundation support, they all get a copy of our brand guidelines that say this is what to do and what not to do when you're talking about our work and uh, fundraising for us. Can anyone think of any other policies or procedures that you might want to have in place when it comes to fundraising? Um, Elizabeth, I do have an example of a GDPR policy. Yes, it's in the um, shared Google Drive that I mentioned. So I will um, uh, put the link to that drive and it's just open access so anyone can access it. So there's a, a couple of examples in there, I think, that are uh, GDPR compliant. and You'll just need to make sure it's suitable for your organisation. Um, so it's not a template. It's just an example of other charities policies that should be suitable for small international development charities. Um, John has said national regulations. Yeah, I think that's really important to think about the national context where you're working. So are there any kind of national standards that you have to adhere to? So looking at, uh, let's say you decide to um, register with the fundraising regulator, they actually have a code of practice. So if you're thinking that you're gonna get serious about your fundraising, um, it would be worthwhile having a scan of the, the, the code of fundraising practice to make sure that what you're doing is kind of um, in line with uh, the expectations of, of fundraising these days in 2022. Um, so a few things to, to take into consideration. So cyber security, you know, a lot of stuff that we do these days is online. Um, Gambling commission. So if you do anything that is about a lottery or a raffle, you know, it's important to make sure that you're doing it in line with kind of the guidance from um, someone like the gambling commission, where it's important to kind of uh, to be aware that that is something that people might be struggling with. And so we don't necessarily want to be encouraging that. Um, are you aware of any other specific external regulators or, or guidelines? Um, there is in uh, development in particular, there is the something called the narrative project, which I think we might have mentioned last time, which talks a little bit about kind of how to ethically fundraise in an international development context um, and around kind of challenging that narrative of um, white savior helps poor person. I think there's also really um, maybe more up to date guidance from, uh, Africa No Filter and uh, Health Poverty Action. Um, and I've sent the link in the last email, I sent links to those documents because they're really good for that. Right. I think ethical fundraising is almost kind of more important to us as international charities than it perhaps could be with local causes. Um, maybe not more important, but you know we have more to consider um, and we have a bigger picture that we are a part of that we all need to be part of the solution for as well and making sure that we don't contribute to these really damaging narratives um, and where possible that we actually um, do good in challenging uh, sort of those, those perceptions. And sometimes it can be a bit of work with your donor base. You know, I've had, I've had conversations um, with ex-supporters or supporters who are sort of saying, you know, well, since you've taken over, 
things don't seem the same. And I liked my child's sponsorship and I'm not sure about all this new way of doing things. And I've kind of had to talk them down a bit and say, well, you know, the charity has been going for 20 years and we've learned and we've reflected and we're doing things differently now because of this, this and this, but it has been an exercise in uh, donor education as well. Um, and I, I do feel strongly that we've all got a responsibility to make sure that we're contributing positively to that. Okay, so some key challenges and barriers then. So you may have been sort of sitting thinking, all of this sounds really good in theory, but practically, I don't know if I'm going to be able to manage this or, you know, I've got some challenges and barriers that's going to make this really hard. So um, we'll launch the poll now, Kath, if you're happy to, and just be interested to sort of see from you all what barriers and challenges you, you seem to be facing. Um, can I do it while I'm screen sharing or do I need to stop? Oh yeah, it comes up. So pick as many as, as sort of are relatable to you and we'll get a sense of um, where these kind of key challenges are for us as a group. Can you all see it? Yeah, I, some people are starting to reply. Cool. Yeah, it's up for me. Does it give you the option to share the results at the end, Kath? Oh, yeah. There we go. It does, yeah. There we go. Sorry, I was talking to you with, uh, with on mute. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so we've got lack of capacity spread too thin. Yes, very relatable. All of us, we all feel like that. No budget available for investment. Again, very relatable. Um, the next highest don't have the skills or the experience. No buy-in from trustees and nervous about doing something new. It's a little bit lower down, but still with a couple of people. So we're going to have another quick breakout now for about 10 minutes. And... Um, I'd like each group to pick one. So obviously the, the real big challenges there for us are the lack of capacity and spread too thin and the lack of budget for investment. So when we get into the breakout rooms, agree in your group, which you think is the one that you would like to talk about. And I'd like us to share some kind of ideas on how to overcome that challenge and how to get past that barrier. And then when we come back as a group, we'll share some of our best insights. Um, because if that, you know, if the lack of capacity thing is, is really uh, the biggest challenge, we do need to think practically about what we can do to, to overcome that. So, um, you know, pick whichever one uh, you want, have a chat with the other people in your group and uh, reach consensus on that. And then we'll come back after 10 minutes and share some ideas with each other. So would anyone from group two, I think it was, like to share your pearls of wisdom? Sorry, was it us? I didn't I didn't pay attention to the number. Apparently it was probably. Was it two? <laughs> yeah, we were two. Yeah. Carol, do you do you mind uh do you mind doing the a little summary or just anything you remember from I think it was a useful discussion okay um oh I can't really remember um okay I'll I help you too <laughs> thank you just just jump in Lena just you know it was about um maybe using sort of volunteers it was about the lack of capacity so about um involving any volunteers that we have um so that you they feel as if they're part of like the trustee network so that everybody's working together they feel valued and then looking at the capacity that they might have to helping them to upskill so that they feel very involved um to try and build up that capacity what else were we saying lena can't remember well, we were, yeah i don't know no problem <laughs> well we found that um it's it's obviously very difficult to start when you don't really have trustees yet so like yeah what do you what do you get get moving how do you get moving from from that point and um using or yeah 
that we said trustees, um, volunteers can turn into trustees, which I know from experience because I used to be one and now I'm a trustee. Um, so yeah, just starting with volunteers and then um, and then doing what Carol said, really uh, trying to make it attractive for them to, to be involved and, and, and um, offer them training. Um, and I know also training is a really big incentive, I think, being upskilled. Um, and we also, uh, you mentioned, Carol, that it's really important to be realistic and um, not set kind of the bar too high to not be disappointed. So it's good to appreciate small steps are also really, uh, yeah, valuable. So sometimes it's just only small steps. I think also is continue to encourage people who are with you, you know, and finding out what skills they have got, having that relationship bit more deeper finding out what they can do and then it really encouraging them and and continuing to like build them up and build their own capacity uh, to help the whole thing so that's pretty much as far as we got i think i'm sure there's loads to say more about that point but <laughs> short time and yeah, yeah easy to get sidetracked no, that's great thank you i think providing upskilling opportunities for volunteers is really a really good point we sort of touched on something similar about um, maybe trying to bring in volunteers who are experts um, kind of in what they're doing but still have or still want to be exposed to new to new skills or new uh, sort of experiment with doing different kinds of fundraising so we we kind of noted that it can be really time consuming to manage trustees and maria made the good point that you know you have limited control over performance because this person is doing it for free um and it's not the same as going back to someone that you're paying and saying actually you've missed this deadline or the quality of this work is not good enough um and so with limited time although it can be valuable to bring in volunteers and upskill them, you might also want to look to sort of specifically recruit people with the skills that you, that you need and bring in, bring them in, in a kind of expert pro bono volunteering. And, you know, in, in the same way that you would um, uh, kind of package it, package your pro programs up for, for funders. Can you package up something like join our executive fundraising committee, you know, something that looks really good on their CV Maybe they're all working in individual fundraising, but they all want to turn their hand to a different type of fundraising that they can't fulfill in their day job. And I mean, to be honest, I got most of my experience professionally through volunteering roles. I would want to have a go with project design or uh, uh, strategic planning or a particular type of fundraising. And I would find a charity and I would go and say, can I do this with you? Because I want to get this experience and, and have this on my CV and it would benefit them and, and benefit me. And I think there are a lot of people at a certain point in their career, uh, you know, who are full of beans and are really kind of eager to boost their CV. Um, practically, I found a really good way of finding those people is to sign up to a free month of LinkedIn premium and to hunt them down on LinkedIn premium by using the advanced uh, filtering where you can list a particular fundraising skill and then you can look for people who've ticked the interested in pro bono volunteering box and then you can send them a message and say you look fantastic come and join my executive development something that sounds very important group <laughs> That um, sounds interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought of, of, of that to actually just approach people on LinkedIn like that. So that really works. Yeah, yeah you found yeah, that. I got, I got five. I, I probably messaged about 30 people. I got five people. They all stayed for about two years. We met monthly. They were great. That's impressive. So, Teachers are that we need to be braver sometimes. I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, Elizabeth just asks, where's the pro bono volunteering box? So if you go on people's profiles, and scroll down to the bottom, you'll see what they've clicked as like, you can contact me uh, on, you know, for these reasons. Some people says like skills-based volunteering, joining a nonprofit board, pro bono consulting. I can't remember the exact wording, but it's those types of things. And then when you've got LinkedIn premium, you can actually use the advanced search function to filter by the people who've checked those boxes. Um, and you can also filter by skill. You can also filter by 
organization they work for. So, you know, you want someone from Action Aid, Action Aid, skilled fundraising, interested in joining a nonprofit board or skills based pro bono consulting or something. And I found volunteers that way, and I found quite a few trustees that way as well. Um, Maria or Elizabeth, um, what else did we talk about? Can you do either of you want to add anything that I missed? No, I think it was it was all fine. Thank you. Um, well, I, I was concerned. Rona. Sorry, Rona. I uh... yeah, no, no, it's no problem. Um, where um, there's a, a core group of trustees working very hard and um, uh, an outer group, if you like, of people who are getting older and how to deal with that. And I was thinking we perhaps need new trustees, but um, Vic, isn't it, was very helpful in saying that perhaps um, you can create other roles for people who still very much interested and attached to the charity so that they could become more in a non-exec advisory group, um, allowing you to bring in new people into the trustees. Um, <laughs> probably a very good way of falling out with everybody when, <laughs> when I, I'm very new, but um, it's it's worth thinking about. Uh, um, I'm interested that um, you're suggesting that nine is about the right number for trustees. Um, so you don't obviously want to go expanding the numbers forever, but you do want to keep um, you know interested people together and not upset anybody. Basically, absolutely. Um, it it can be a very emotionally uh you know people's or emotions are very tied up in these things and particularly if you are new it could it could be very nerve-wracking making that suggestion <laughs> i think it, just to respond to that point i think reminding people about why they're there and that we all need to make decisions that are the best for the charity and we're not you know each of us is not a beneficiary of this organization we are not here to benefit from our role necessarily we we are here to make decisions that, that are the best for the organization and just keep bringing it back to what's best for the organization can help to remove some of that kind of personal emotional stuff um, but I, I appreciate how difficult it can be to have to start having those conversations and uh, just quickly on trustee numbers so kind of there's a I, I think there's a real sweet spot for boards of about six or seven six, seven or eight, maybe. I think anything less than uh, six, there usually aren't really enough uh, people to be able to do all of the roles that you need on a board. And then when you start getting to sort of eight and nine, and certainly over that, the, the group becomes so big that everybody kind of disappears into anonymity and the group can become less effective. So um, that's six, seven, eight kind of spot I think is a real sweet spot for a, a group size um, and I think in terms of funders yeah anything on the lower end or the very high end of the spectrum starts to raise some flags um, for, for funders as well. Uh, so we are finishing any moment now and um, I'll just finish show you my last few um, slides before we finish off but thank you all for sharing your thoughts on uh, on that. And I think the lack of capacity issue is something that we absolutely all struggle with and um, sort of thinking a bit laterally about how to resolve that um, can, uh, can, can make a big difference. And as I was mentioning earlier about kind of getting your board of trustees right, getting the right people uh, on your board, that can be one of those things that, that can make a, a really radical uh, sort of change when it comes to capacity issues. So if we think about, we now have hopefully the, the bare bones of our strategic, uh, of our fundraising strategic plan. We, we do wanna be able to monitor it and review our progress because there's sort of not much point in us having this plan and then saving it in a folder somewhere and then never looking at it again. So we want to be able to look back on our smart objectives and our KPIs, uh, KPIs and have um, a way of monitoring them. So. Um, 
who do you need to report your progress to? What format will you report your progress? I mean, quite often we have in small organizations, somebody who is the CEO and the chair and the founder and the fundraiser. And so you find yourself reporting to yourself, but it might be nice to identify somebody else within the organization who you can feel a little bit accountable to and they can support you and guide you. Um, are you going to provide a little um, narrative report to that person or to the, the, the rest of the board of trustees? Are you going to provide a financial update um, to them? How are you actually going to report to them how things are going? And, and not just report to them, but how are you actually going to keep track for yourself of how things are going? You know, you, you set your target at 10,000. It's now, let's say, April, May, June. If you're only £1,000 in, do you need to adapt your tactics? Uh, are there any risks and assumptions in the plan? How will you test these? Um, and how often will you update or respond to changes? So as I mentioned earlier, kind of having your fundraising targets fluctuate month by month is probably a little bit tricky to, to manage because you're, you're sort of aiming for your goal and the goal is sort of keep moving. Um, but you do want to adapt throughout the year because we are small and agile organizations where things change quickly and can change significantly. So it might be worth saying that each quarter we'll have a formal review of where we are, how, how kind of we've made progress and if we need to, to change anything. So some final tips then. If we can to create a culture of fundraising where people value fundraising and they're not scared of it and they don't see fundraising as a dirty word, uh, involving trustees and anyone else who you can think to, to bring in sort of volunteers or, or key supporters, have a plan. So have an organizational budget that allows you to set clear and realistic goals, manage expectations as well. So, you know, understand that, you know, we are possibly working to a one in 10 success rate on this, or, you know, let's not set ourselves up to, to fail. Let's set kind of ambitious, but also realistic goals and then get the support that you need. Um, on here, it mentions FSI training. Um, I'm delivering this program kind of uh, on behalf of the FSI and there's lots of support available there for particular types of fundraising. Um, Kath will tell you some other support that's available as well in a minute um, and build your fundraising crew of people, you know, find other people like you who are at your organization's sort of uh, stage of life and make friends with them and connect with them and, and don't sort of sit on your own at home trying to work your way through this uh, alone. Uh, do it, do it together wherever possible. And there is a, there are a lot of people and a lot of resources out there to support you and so that you don't have to do it alone. Um, we are sort of on the dot now, time-wise, I think. Um, and there was one question that came up in the chat about um, full cost recovery. And then Kath, I think you wanted to mention something at the end as well. Um, so very quickly, full cost recovery is making sure that you recover um, all of the costs associated with a particular piece of work. So let's say you um, have a project that costs £5,000 to deliver, but you spend 10 hours a week managing it. And when you spend that 10 hours a week managing it, you drive back and forth or get the train back and forth to an office uh, and you need to hire a room and you know all of those costs that you might sort of consider support costs or overheads, all of that needs to be wrapped in to the, the budget for that program. And when you apply for funding for that program, all of those costs need to be included because if not, you get £5,000 to deliver the project, but you've got £2,000 of additional support costs that you now need to find from somewhere else. So the way that we do this practically is to kind of describe as much as possible as project costs rather than support costs. If you're a person delivering a project and you have to get a train to get there or you have to use your car to help you deliver the project, that's a project cost. That's a cost that relates to the delivery of the project. Um, there are whole courses on full cost recovery, so it's a huge topic to go into, but it's definitely something to start being aware of now to avoid being out of pocket in future. Sorry to have taken us over a bit, Kath. I know you've got 
something a few bits that you wanted to wrap up with but um and um, we i'm happy to um stick around if uh, people wanted to ask any questions but equally um those questions can uh, be funneled through to um Kath and passed on to me um, i'm happy to pick those up by email afterwards as well Thanks, Vic. That's really kind of you. Um, and thank you for a lovely session. I found it really informative and I, I can see lots of people nodding. So, yeah, good. Thank lovely. Uh, thanks very much, Vic. Um, I do want to say that um, Vic has come through us through the FSI and I highly recommend them. I mean, obviously, I'm going to say come to Help Me Africa and we'll give you support. But also the FSI support is fantastic. So do have a look at their courses. They're very reasonable and their one to one support is great as well. Um, so uh, do get in touch with them. 